Hey CFS Warriors, it's Victoria coming to you with Alex Howard, founder and CEO of the Optimum Health Clinic, a leading UK charity specializing in ME, CFS, and fibro, and also the author of the book, Why Me? My Journey from ME to Health and Happiness. Alex founded the clinic in 2004 after suffering with ME for seven years, and since that time, the clinic has served over 5,000 patients in 35 countries. On the cutting edge of research, the OHC published a landmark study in the BMJ Open finding statistically significant improvement in all patient groups at three months using its integrative medicine approach. And it's currently undertaking a randomized control trial in partnership with the University of Surrey. Today, Alex and I will be discussing underlying patterns of CFS, ME, and fibro. So thanks for joining us. Welcome, Alex. Thank you so much for being here to chat with me for a few minutes. Really Thanks, appreciate pleasure. it. And you know, your work has been extremely valuable in my own ongoing recovery, not only working with Secrets to Recovery, which is your online resource, which is amazing, but also working with both departments, the nutrition department and the psychology department over the past couple of years. So I just want to give you a huge thank you for all your work that you've done to help people that are suffering with this debilitating illness. So thank, thank you. you. Right. Thank you. So I just, as we will be discussing underlying patterns that uh, can lead to chronic illnesses like this, uh, could you clarify your view and how the clinic views the illness? Is it psychological or physical? So one of the things about chronic fatigue, ME, fibromyalgia, and that group of illnesses is that there are almost as many different versions of the illness as there are people that are impacted or affected by it. Mm. And so some people will come in and they'll say, you know, my illness is only physical. And there's a kind of, there's a certain emotional charge, let's say, about the idea there's any kind of psychological element that's going on. And other people will come in and they recognize the psychological side, but they feel like they've done everything physically and they feel like they've already explored all of that. Yeah. And our experience is that the vast majority of people, there are physical factors that are going on, there are psycho-emotional factors that are going on, there may be things in their environment, there'll be things that are perhaps genetically that are having an impact, there are life events that have happened to them, there are perhaps viruses in their, in their system. There are so many different versions and experiences of this group of illnesses. That's part of what as practitioners makes it so fascinating but of course, the patient makes it so challenging and so difficult. And the majority of practitioners and uh, experts in the field, they'll be dealing with one part of the group of illnesses. And their understanding is that part is what's happening for everyone. And what you normally see in that situation is that a percentage of people they work with will do really well with that approach because it's the subtype or it's the stage of the condition or it's the, the areas that are, that are relevant to them. And they're the people which will continue having treatment with that practitioner. So that practitioner will get more evidence that that's the bit, the bit which is which is going on. Right. Of course, the people that are perhaps not so helped by that person will tend to drift away and, and drift towards other things. The analogy that, that we sometimes use, it's almost like you've got 10 blindfolded people that are touching an elephant and they're describing what an elephant is. And one of them's got the trunk, and they're kind of saying, well, it's kind of bendy, and it's long, and it's kind of, you know, it's a kind of funny thing on the end. Another one's got the ear and saying, no, it's not. It's kind of big and kind of flappy, and it's like that. Another one's got the leg. And yeah. So they're describing different parts of the same picture. And the essence of the Optimum Health Clinic approach is there is no one answer. We don't claim to have all the answers, but we've really had an approach over the, the years of – trying to systematically research and test as many different ways of working to get increasing clarity about this group of illnesses. That's very interesting. And I know for myself, working with like your nutritional department, Leslie's been addressing things like adrenal fatigue and mitochondrial dysfunction and things like that to support my body. And the great thing is also being able to work on some of these things we're going to talk about today, like the underlying patterns that can lead to illness. So, you know, it seems like that dual approach or the multifaceted approach is really, really a good way to go. So, and, and what you guys specialize in. So, how did you first become aware of these underlying patterns and realize that it was important for recovery? Was it during your own recovery or was it with your work with the clinic? 
So in my own recovery, there were things that became obvious to me about my own experience. Um, at that point, I wasn't really thinking about working with other people. I was far, far too concerned with my own kind of life situation. Yeah. Um, when I set up the Oxford Health Clinic and started growing a, a, a little team of practitioners, we recognized that because some of the early practitioners and, and now over half the clinic team had ourselves had any chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia and recovered. We could recognize, right, recognize certain things in ourselves. Yeah. And then when you start to work with hundreds and inside thousands of people, you actually could be fairly dumb and still recognize patterns. And hopefully if you're very smart, or <laughs> some of us like might pack in on certain days, um, uh, but you just start to see patterns. And when you're looking for patterns and you're attuned towards that and you're applying certain maps that help you get clarity about that, over time, and you know, the Optimum Health Care now has been going for something like 13 years, in that 12, 13 years, in that time, it's like we've got increasing clarity. And then what we could swap at one point was the kind of disconnected maps of different things that were happening. We then started to recognize that different bits of the map also fitted together in a kind of grand unifying theory. And again, that's not to say the optimal health clinic approach is a totally complete approach. It absolutely isn't. And I, I would hope when I look back on some of the things we were doing 10 years ago, I, I kind of think, oh my God, we really did it that way? And I hope in 10 years' time I will feel the same yeah. about the things that we're working now because that's a sign of innovation and, and, and progress and development. But certainly by working with literally thousands of people, with a team of practitioners, over which a half over which have had themselves had their own journey with any kind of deep fibromyalgia, it's just certain things have become very clear in the process of doing this. Right. Now, what are some of these underlying patterns and how have these patterns contributed to illness is what you've seen? So this is obviously um, it's a big topic and I'll just yeah. give a very simple overview of some of the maps and then I think the, the focus here is to look at the, what we call the subtypes or the predisposing factors and we'll look particularly at the psychological elements of those. Okay. But just to put the overall kind of map in context, we talk about um, subtypes, we talk about predisposing factors, like the things that have to be out of balance for somebody to get sick in the first place and the things that often when people have relapse are often the things that haven't been fully dealt with, thus having that situation of recreating the, the, the early experience. Yeah. We then talk about stages of recovery. Yeah. And there are different stages on the path of recovery which are important, and certain treatments that are helpful at one stage are actually very unhelpful at another stage. So mapping of stages is important. And then we also talk about different systems, so different bodily systems that are impacted. So we look at things like uh, maladaptive stress response, so impact on the nervous system, we look at mitochondrial function, we look at the digestive system, adrenal system, so there's many different bodily systems that are impacted. So that, that's just a kind of brief overview, we talk about subtypes, stages and systems. Yeah. If we come into subtypes, um, we break that down into psychological subtypes and physiological subtypes, or nutritional subtypes. Yeah. Um, to put it in very brief terms, nutritional subtypes would be the adrenal subtype, the immune subtype, the digestive subtype, and the toxicity overload subtype. Okay. Psychological subtypes would be the achiever subtype, the helper subtype, the anxiety subtype, and the trauma subtype. Just to put in context again, subtypes are really important because most people haven't got all of these, a few people have got all of them, but most people have a number of these. And if you have a number of these things out of balance for a long period of time, that becomes significantly depleting on the body. And the body significantly depleted in that way, that alone can lead to a result of something like chronic fatigue, ME, fibromyalgia. Often what you see is those things weakening the system, and then you see a tipping point. So you see the final straw that broke the camel's back, you see someone gets a virus, or they go through a divorce, or they have some um, uh, physical injury, but something significant happens, and that becomes the tipping point. And the danger is that then, in trying to understand the illness, there's a lot of focus on the, on the tipping point, on the trigger. People think, well, it was the virus, or it was the trauma, or it was the injury. And we would say that if you haven't had all of those things depleting the system in advance, mm. 
you probably would recover from that trigger much more quickly. Right. I know you often talk about the boat. Right. And so the load loads, the boat. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. The loads on the boat, and then that final trigger comes that kind of sinks that boat. So you've described physical as well as psychological. I would imagine, and is it true that most of your patients may come in with a mix of both? Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And it's different in different people, and you know. In a sense, the more significant the loads are of those subtypes, the more likely that is to have an impact. You know, some people, for example, with anxiety, they may not have had much anxiety before getting chronic fatigue, getting fibromyalgia, but living with an illness like that is very anxiety inducing, where you sure. don't know what's wrong with you, why it's wrong with you, how long it's going to be wrong with you, what to do about it, will you ever recover? And that causes a whole stress response in the system, which is it. Also, a separate thing from the subtypes, but just on a very brief comment on that, it's not just what causes someone to get sick, it's what stops the body from healing. So we have all these subtypes that can cause someone to get sick, but if the body is in a very high state of anxiety and stress, that can have a significant impact in blocking the healing process. So anxiety has an interesting role. It can be a predisposing factor, but it can also be a perpetuating factor. Sure, and just it seems to me I've just learned so much from your clinic about that heightened stress response. And once your body's in that, it's so much easier to go into anxiety, whether right. you had ever struggled with like that you said, if it wasn't even a predisposing factor, things that normally wouldn't, I remember the phone ringing would just set my body because I was at such an elevated level. So, right. and I love how your clinic really goes into about how to get your body into a healing state because that seems really important for recovery. If you're not in a healing state, you're obviously not going to heal. So um, why is it important for people to recognize and deal with these patterns? Is it essential for their recovery path, do you think? Yeah. And I'm it, thinking in terms of the psychological, but you yeah. can address both yeah. of them. Well, let, yeah. let, 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 let's just briefly dive into those subtypes a little bit more. Yes, please. Uh -huh. context. So yeah. the Achiever subtype is where effectively we – judge our self-worth as a human being by how much we do and how much we achieve in the world. So we're constantly driving ourselves to be, do more than we are at this point in time. Right. So in the time leading up to someone getting sick, what that might look like is someone is, their body is telling them they're exhausted. And yet they're like, I absolutely need to get to do this thing that I need to achieve. So maybe it gets to six o'clock at the end of the day at work and their body's like, oh, I need to go home and rest. And their mind is like, I've got to deliver this project, I've got to hit this target, I've got to get to this outcome. So they keep on ignoring their body in that process. After a while, that is very depleting, and we can see how that leads to burnout. But also on the recovery path, if what's happening is as soon as energy comes back, mm -hmm. we're immediately trying to do more than we have the resources to do, we get on a boom and bust cycle. It makes it very difficult to have a sustainable, long-lasting recovery if we have a significant pushing achiever pattern that's going on. The helper subtype is where we consistently place other people's needs as being more important than our own. Mm -hmm. So in the time leading up to get ill, what that might look like is, taking that example before, we get home from work, and maybe at seven o'clock in the evening, we're just relaxing on the sofa, and then a friend calls us and needs support and asks us to go around. And our body says, I don't want to, I don't want to do that, I haven't got the energy to do it, and we just, Ignore it. Yeah. And that's something we do consistently day after day, week after week, oh. month after month. And again, you can see how that would eventually, in an, as an energy depleting way of living, have an impact on, on wearing down our, our body and our, our systems. If on the recovery path, energy starts to come back, and as energy starts to come back, we immediately ignore our own needs and we take care of everyone else, or we don't ever let ourselves get the quality rest that we need to to heal because we're constantly taking care of everybody else, we're not going to be able to have the rest and healing work that we need. So we have to learn to take care of our own needs rather than always be taking care of everyone else. If we look at the anxiety type, we mentioned that a few moments ago, if the body's in a constant state of stress and anxiety, it can't heal. And if, To put it in simple medical terms, if your sympathetic nervous system is constantly overstimulated, and you're not kicking into your parasympathetic nervous system, 
There's no active healing processes that are able to happen. You're not digesting food. Your immune system's overstimulated, and then often it's either hyperactive, therefore you're having allergies and tolerances, or it's under-effective and you're constantly getting kind of colds and bugs and flus and, and those kinds of things. Um, so the body has to be in a healing state for healing processes to happen. And then just taking the final of the psychological subtypes, the trauma subtype, it, it can be... There's been a significant trauma, what we would call it a big T trauma. Yeah. But it could also be what we call a small T trauma, and otherwise called developmental trauma or covert trauma, where it's not any one significant event that's happened, but we didn't get the holding and the nurturing and the support that we needed in our developmental years, and we haven't learned how to give that to ourselves in our own lives day to day. Mm. Wow. What that therefore means is that our system is very sensitive. Because it's, it's like carrying around trauma is like having a massive bin line full of rubbish that everywhere we go, we're lugging that around with us. Yeah. And it's just draining and it's depleting for our system. And so learning to, to process that, to digest that, to let go of that has a big impact in taking a load off the system. But also it means that our nervous system can respond more appropriately to life day to day rather than being so sensitive. Right. And just how does your clinic help people identify these patterns and overcome them? So part of what's really interesting is when you present these patterns in this way, often immediately people start to recognize themselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'll go through the patterns and someone will go, oh my God, I, I'm all of those. And I've never seen myself laid out in that yeah. way. So there's a certain amount of self-reflection that comes in. Yeah. But then we talk about going from seeing it at, at the kind of higher level, like just recognizing, yes, I do that, yeah. to actually being able to see the pattern as we're living it. Mm. So we have a phrase, if you can see it, you don't have to be it. Yeah. So the yeah. more you can see it, the more you can change the pattern. And seeing it on a high level doesn't necessarily equate to seeing that pattern moment to moment as you're living it catching it, having a way of breaking that pattern and shifting what's happening. So there are certain uh, techniques, tools, and strategies that we will teach people to help them identify patterns consciously and unconsciously, and then ways to change those patterns, to retrain the nervous system, do some kind of rewiring of how the pathways work in the brain, and how to coach themselves in a different way. Like how to make better choices, how to communicate those choices to other people. Um, you know, we think about our psychology department as about working with subtypes, learning to calm the nervous system, and learning to pace and coach ourselves on the recovery path. And they're obviously different people require different elements at different points. Right. Interesting. Now, let me just ask one last question. Can you tell me about how patterns may be related to relapse? So when someone's recovered and they're six months down the road or two years down the road, what's your experience in seeing people that have relapsed and do these play into that? Well, part of the origin behind, I was saying earlier that we understood patterns by working with a lot of people. Yeah. And part of that was by recognizing what we did wrong when we worked with people. So to give you an example, in the earlier few years of the clinic, we had some people make some amazing recoveries, like people that have been housebound for years or bedbound for periods of time, go back and live completely normal lives, and then several years later, come back to the clinic having had a relapse. And initially, you'd be kind of scratching our heads and you're, or what went wrong. And then we realized they were effectively, they have recovered, but then they've gone back into the world and they've recreated exactly the same life that made them sick in the first place. Wow. And so, lo and behold, they ended up sick again because they've created the same system, the same set, set in the same situation. Yeah. And so that was one of the way, the key ways you identify the achiever pattern, that we could see this, this going back into the world and massive pushing of themselves. Wow. Um, again, with the health pattern, we could just see that people were doing that. And so if we don't deal with these underlying patterns, the danger is, well, firstly, we can't, if we recover, there's a fairly good chance for a period of time we didn't do those patterns. And it might be we were just so sick that we couldn't help people, we couldn't achieve, we just had to accept that. Right. As energy started to come back, <laughs> yep. we could get away with doing those things, and perhaps we did for a while, perhaps we got away with it for a few years. But in the end, if we don't deal with the underlying patterns that cause us to get sick, there's a significant chance of recreating the illness. And this doesn't mean 
that, are, that to recover from any chronic fatigue, you can't ever achieve things in your life and you can't help people. Uh -huh. But it's doing it in a balanced, sustainable, self-aware way. And that's the difference. It's not that people on the other side don't live a full life. You can have a much more full life if you do it in a way which is sustainable. And that's the difference and having the awareness to be able to do that. Wow. That is really fascinating. And, you know, I look at it in my own journey because uh, I can t so relate to that about when you're sick, you can't help people. You can't achieve. You can't do it. But when you start rebuilding your health and suddenly that energy is available, where is it going to go? Because even then it's limited. And then as you continue and fully recover, we are not, you know, we don't have an infinite source of energy we need to really I guess a lot of it is learning to listen to your body too and managing that so wow that's some really insightful information Alex thank you so much again for your time this has just been fabulous and appreciate again all the work that you're doing thank you Victoria. take care Bye. be sure to take advantage of the clinic's free 15-minute chats you can talk with either or both departments and find out how they can help you you can also order their free information packet and DVD, and I highly recommend that you get a hold of their online resource, Secrets to Recovery. It's very affordable, and it could be a tremendous asset to you in your recovery, as it has been to mine. Just to mention, I am in no way connected professionally with the OHC. I just love their work. Now, three last things. If you're on the road to recovery and you could use some encouragement, be sure to subscribe to my channel and give this video a thumbs up and lastly, warriors, always remember, life is not over, it's starting again.